Hello everyone, this is Mirko Guerrini and I welcome you to the Jazz Transcription Clinic, a monthly interviews podcast where we talk with accomplished jazz doctors about their lives, career and their personal secrets on the art of transcribing. If you want to improve at jazz, stay tuned and follow the Jazz Transcription Clinic on the socials for more content. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Jazz Transcription Clinic. Uh, Today I'm really honoured and pleased to have uh, one of the uh, best saxophone player in the world. Uh, he is a legendary saxophone player. He uh, lives in Canada, and uh, I mean, I feel almost embarrassed to introduce him. And uh, but what can I say? Uh, he has played with all the high class musicians of the history of jazz, and uh, in particular, I was really, really. Um, impressed by the fact that uh, you have played with some of the best um, drummers in the world. So uh, he has recorded with uh, such a long list of artists and you can check him out on the web and you can certainly listen to, to his music but to name just a few he recorded and played for a long time in the band of Elvin Jones, he played in the Buddy Rich big band, in the Louis Belson big band, in the Woody Herman big band, he had his own band uh, and his own big band. So uh, let me introduce to you our guest doctor for today is the one and only Pat LaBarbera. Thanks Pat thank and welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm uh, really, really honored to, to have you. Uh, I met Pat uh, several years ago. I was playing at Rochester Jazz Festival and our common friend Roberto Occhipinti uh, was playing with, with uh, Pat as well. So he introduced me to Pat. And uh, I think we also played at the jam session, maybe one, one tune in Rochester and um, but I, oh yeah if, uh, yeah on the stage oh yeah, yeah yeah but I think I did miserably as I usually do when I play next to uh, some really good players but um no I was true uh, I was reading through your your biography and the first thought I had is gee this guy has played with the best drummers in the whole world, in the whole history of jazz. It must have been tough, you know, to have well, been, you know. Well, the, the main two, of course, were you know, seven, almost seven years with Buddy Rich, and I was with Elvin for so many years off and on from 1975 until he died. I, yeah. I would go back and forth, but, you know, those two specifically. But then again, when you play with those drummers, other drummers would come and play with you. So when I was with Buddy Rich's band, Papa Joe Jones, Philly Joe Jones, Art Blakey, uh, they would all sit in with the band. So you got a chance to play with them. And of course with Elvin, and you know, other drummers would come by and, and you, you would play with them. So if, if you're not, you know, at least you got to play one or two tunes with uh, some of the great uh, jazz drummers also. But then again, through, working with uh, uh, school situations, we would bring certain people in like Jack Deshaun that would come into the school where I was playing, you know, or um, I worked with like Eddie Shaughnessy and some of the, some of the other, you know, great drummers would come and play. And of course my brother Joe is, uh, is I consider one of the great drummers also. And I played with him for years. Uh, and so many great drummers in Toronto, you know, that, uh, that live here. And uh, so I've had a chance to work with quite a few of the, of the greatest drummers, but those two, Buddy Rich and Elvin Jones, were my main focus. Yes, and I can't imagine. I mean, I had the privilege to do a short tour with uh, Billy Cobham mm-hmm. years yeah. ago, and that was my, you know, top uh, level drumming. 
and it was such a different experience, you know, when you play with, with those guys. But I can't imagine like playing with Buddy Rich and Elvin yeah. Jones. You know? <laughs> yeah. it's, whoa. It's, uh, you know, it was a eye opening. I mean, I came right out of college at Berkeley and went right to Buddy Rich's band. Uh, and went right on the road with him for almost seven years. And then from then I moved to Toronto and uh, I left Buddy in 74. And in 75, I went with Elvin. So it was about a year in, in between. And then I went with Elvin. Now, Elvin's band was not a heavy road like Buddy's band. Buddy's band, we were on the road all the yeah. time. But Elvin would do a month tour or we'd go, I'd go down and do the Village Vanguard for a week and come home for a month and then go somewhere else, go to Chicago, go to LA and then go to Europe. Was If we were out for a long time, we'd go to Europe for about a month, maybe, yeah. maybe a little more in Japan. Yeah, that must have been you know, a nice gig to do. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it, was, it was a great experience for me. Yeah, so thanks again for joining the, the clinic. Well, yeah. today and uh, as our listeners uh, know now we are focusing on jazz transcription and uh, hopefully we will discuss and we will provide some good advice on why and what is best to transcribe so mm -hmm. if you um, agree i would shoot the first question but sure yeah, yeah sure so, Pat, if you transcribe, why you do so? For me, it was always being inquisitive. What was that that I heard on the record? And what, what was that player doing? That was the very first thing that ever got to me. First of all, I knew nothing about harmony and theory. I just loved playing. But I wanted to know what that sound was that they were getting. And why are they playing those notes? So when I was in high school, that's when it started. I would I would take at that time I was maybe playing alto and I was t I would take the alto out and play along with recordings. I wouldn't write anything down because I wasn't that skilled at writing notes out. Um, and as I taught myself by taking a Berkeley correspondence course, they published it one time in Downbeat, and I I learned about harmony and theory by teaching myself. My father had theory books as he was a musician. And then I would just, what is that on the record and how do I get it on my horn? And that was the first thing. And, and so I learned all of these things by ear. And I would be able to play along with the soloist. Sometimes I would learn a full solo, but most of the times it was mostly sections and fragments that appealed to me. So I took chunks of the solos that I liked and, and learned them and be able to play them along with, with the recordings. The things that I learned by ear, most of them stayed with me up until now. I mean, quite a, quite a few of them. Others I just wrote down to see, uh, you know, what is he doing there? I remember transcribing Coltrane's uh, Countdown uh, solo. Uh, when I was in Berkeley, I did that. And then I wrote all of that out. And I started writing things out when I was in high school and maybe after I graduated from high school when I went to college and then I came, I left and came back and worked for a while in, at home before I went to Berkeley, I started transcribing. And by then I had a knowledge of, you know, like um, calligraphy and I could write things out. Yeah. And then I would start writing the souls out. But the first thing that hit me was, what is that on the recording and how do I get it onto my instrument by using my ear? Yeah, thanks. So uh, when you transcribe, what do you expect to bring home? What do you expect to uh, achieve? I wanted to try to get the inflections, the things that they were doing that were not just the notes. Like what is the, the intent behind the note, the feeling behind the note? I mean, my original, the players that I listened to when I first came up were like Stan Getz, Jerry Mulligan, uh, Lester Young was a huge influence on me, still is to this day. Uh, to those players, the older, of course, Charlie Parker was one, uh, and then later on, as I got, uh, uh, Sonny Rollins was, of course, another big yeah. influence on me. And I listened a lot to Sonny, and, and uh, so that, to me, I was really like, how do they get get the feeling? I would try to play along exactly like it to try to draw the emotion from the recording. Because you can feel the emotion coming off the recording of, of certain artists, ones that really have a, a deep meaning behind what they play. Yeah. They they emit something through the through their solo that I picked up and that's what kind of drew drew me to the to the transcription. So yes, I, I do agree hundred percent. And 
you know, to all our listeners or people who want to approach transcription, uh, this is a constant answer we get in this podcast. You know, you never, uh, your job never ends to get the, just the pitch, mm-hmm. but your job becomes profitable when you go beyond the pitch and yeah. or behind the pitch, I would say. So, uh, as I say to my students, you know, everyone is able to play a G sharp, but yeah. can you play that Sonny Rollins G sharp? That's right. That's the one that the player is playing. Yeah. And sometimes just to play that G sharp takes you like two weeks of practice and some exploration, you know, maybe you have to change your embouchure or maybe you have to try a different mod piece, you know, to try to get that inflection, that little nuance that there is behind that G sharp. So I, I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, oh, that's that's what I'm. Uh, what that that always drew me to the solo. I have certain solos that I just loved, and I always went went to. There's still ones that I play today that I I still can't I can't get. Some of them I even read. I'll I'll put the transcription. On. I read along with the solo. As a matter of fact, I'm doing more of that now. Uh, other people's transcriptions, I will just take them and read them. You know, I have. Yeah. all the transcription books downstairs because I was a teacher I had to have all of those things yeah. and now I'm I'm doing them myself yeah. yes that's true and uh, what was the idea behind uh, like choosing the solos you wanted to transcribe or even if you transcribe just a line what is the factor that catches your attention and you say oh I want to know this yeah, uh, sometimes it was something. Uh, in your early years, it's usually something spectacular. You know, you see some, you hear something like, "What is it?" You know, like that's great. You know, I want, I want to be able to play that that phrase, and so you take that. Later on, you realize that there's there's some subtleties in transcription where you really want to try to catch something very, very uh, you know, it's, it's kind of quiet and soft and not so spectacular. But in the early stages, it was the flash. You look for something. Man, how do I play that? I'm looking at. I'm looking at one of my early transcriptions here, and it was Stan Getz with Dizzy Gillespie, and so it's like a, an old, an old book that I had, and I wrote it down. But this is yeah. Stan Getz playing on it. Don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Yeah. And right off the top of the solo, he's in A minor, and I'm and I was like, what is what is he doing there? I would basically find out. I knew the chord, but why is Stan Getz playing an F sharp on an A minor chord, and then why does he go to an F natural? And then why does he go back? So he's playing a line cliche, basically based on the sixth and the flat six. But to, to look at it and see it, and then once I had a theory and harmony course behind me, I could see what was going on harmonically. But usually, it, and of course, this solo had a, it was just technically amazing what Stan Getz could do on this solo. And 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 this is one I had to slow down. Some of them I didn't. Some of them I would just put them on. And back when I was recording, or not recording, but uh, transcribing, uh, it was only LPs, right? There was no tape. Yeah. So you had to you had to have a record player that had had 16, and you would take a 33 and slow it down to 16, and you would get almost half with the with the pitch a little bit out, and then you could transcribe this, the notes and. Uh, and was write, the pitch write. dropping an octave? Yeah, drops an octave. Yeah. Because my dad, my dad was a saxophone and clarinet player too, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. he had one of those tape, you know, very old <clears throat> suitcase, you know, with a tape recorder, and he used to transfer, uh, basically Stan Gates or Paul Desmond, on yeah. the tape, and then the tape recorder had a switch to go half yeah. speed. Speed, yeah. But it was dropping an octave, so it was interesting because, like, yeah. the tenor yeah. saxophone became like, boo, 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 boo. Well, yeah, that's it. That's, yes. well, but you know what I liked about that was, and that's how I even practiced today, was I practiced at that tempo a lot of times because I want to be able to get the boo, do, boo, da, be, do, boo, boo. I want to be able to feel all of that. Tempo. So when I practice, I actually practice like it's a slowed down record. And also what I noticed, because I remember we, I, I did my first transcriptions using that methodology. Uh, <clears throat> and I remember I could hear exactly where the artist was breathing. Yes, you can, and, see, the, you hear, you can see hear everything if you yeah. have a good sound, or sound system. You and know. You, you hear also the tonguing, how hard, yeah. you know, That's the it. it's here. Yeah. So you, you can 
have a great understanding and a very deep understanding on, on the uh, playing process mm. going on there. So I remember I was taking note of all the breaths and oh, here you have to take a big one and and just to get close enough, you know, to, yeah. the, to the final result. We have basically already um, explored a little bit uh, the next question, but uh, the next question is what methodology you apply when you transcribe or do you use any software in these days? Uh, now, I mean, when the first I, see, uh, I used to talk with Mike Brecker quite a bit. He used to use, uh, was it an amazing slow downer? I think yep. it was one. You know, I think that he and I were using that because we were used to talk about transcription. He was asking, he always asked me which ones I was using. I use, um, now what I do is I have... Um, which I have four of them on my phone, and I just, and I have everything on my phone now. So it's uh, it's uh, I'm using Music Speed Changer, and I'm using uh, what's the other one here? Tempo Slow Mo. Those are two. Like Tempo Tempo Slow Mo is uh, is this thing here? Looks yeah. like that. And the other one, but this one is the one I use uh, quite a bit. Uh, this um, this thing is called Music Speed Changer. <laughs> Yeah, because I, here's, I had to put uh, one, the, the thing I was doing with Roberto had it was so difficult to play. I had to have it put in here. Anyway, so here I could slow it down to. So I like, this one is one that I, I like quite a bit, but that's if I want to really write it down and log it into a, into a book, then I would use something like that. Otherwise, I'll just play along with it and just try to, you know, try to see if I can pick it up in regular, regular tempo. And do you do it with the saxophone or you use, for example, the piano? Or no, I always, I always do it with the tenor. Even the piano solos, I would probably do it with the tenor. Just try to try to grab them with, uh, with the tenor. I don't use the piano. I mean, I use the piano for other things. I have it in my studio, but I don't use it for transcription. Unless I'm looking for the chords, the chord changes. Yeah. Then I yeah, will do right. the keyboard. And uh, so if I insist on, on this, so you listen to like one phrase or one bar or a beat yes. and then you repeat you listen several times till you get it or you first write it down I have to get close and then i'm trying to if i try to memorize it then i just keep playing it back and forth back and forth and then i'll come back to it the next day i'm hoping i can remember some of it but usually you forget you got to keep and especially the older you get you got to keep doing it and doing it in order to put all of those things in because you know, it's, it's when you're younger, the mind retains that stuff a little bit faster. But, you know, I'll just put it, I'll just keep playing along with it. And sometimes I have to slow it down. If it's really, if I can't hear the note or if I'm missing something, I want to, I want to be accurate. So I will slow it to say, okay, there's a little grace note or something that I'm missing. And, and that's, yeah, that's one a good key, you know, to, to notice and to uh, make clear that, you don't want just to get the pitch again i'm i'm reiterating the concept but you you want to be accurate with the style because we are learning a style we are learning a different dialect in music and mm -hmm. you need to catch the uh, the the exact sound and be able to reproduce it so uh, that's right i i sometimes use uh, there is a website uh, called Tune Transcriber, which is free, uh, and you can upload some tracks onto it, and uh, you can also like loop parts of it, and you can save the loops. In the free version, you cannot. If you pay a subscription, which is probably only like twenty-five dollars or so. You can save your work. Oh yeah, tune, tune transcribers. Well, there's one called Song Transcriber. No, it's called TuneTranscriber.com. Oh, here. Here, here it is. Here I've got it. Okay, I'm gonna just bookmark it because yeah, and 
I use it because uh, it's very convenient. You can like loop one phrase, save mm -hmm. it, and come back the next day, for example. So you have all the loops already done, and then you can loop like four bars and then eight bars. So you can also plan your work and and you know keep going with your work without losing. Uh, as you said, you know, the next day you still have memory of your work. So there are some good, you know, helps out there yeah, on, on the web. I'm not aware of that one, but I'll certainly look into it. I'm not teaching anymore, but it would certainly be one I would rec recommend for students, but I'd like them to kind of do their own work. Yeah. To me, I would say this would probably be somebody like for me who's done so much transcribing that now if I need something in a hurry, I'd rather, you know, put, have someone else do it. Although yeah, I, yeah. Know, certainly, even though, I mean, uh, young students now, they, they have access to all sort of, uh, sorcery, right? Uh, all sorts of, uh, mechanical or technological, uh, tools that they can use to help them. But, uh, in a way it's also a limitation to their growth. Because I remember that my first solo, for example, that I ever transcribed was uh, a Lester Young solo on a blues called Easy Does It. And it took me probably, I don't know, three months or four months to complete. And it's only, I think, three choruses on a blues, right? And it took me three months. And then I went to check with my teacher and it was like 80% wrong. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but then the second solo was maybe seventy percent wrong, and then I got to the point years later uh, where I could be accurate, and it took me maybe a week instead of three months, uh, and that because I could only rely on my ear, and at the same time while trying to get the note, I was improving my ear. I was ear training myself. Well, I had a student one time who had, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with his embouchure. He had a real choky sound. I gave him all, I said, I told him everything that he had to do. I gave him exercises. He couldn't get it. He couldn't, and the sound was always like, so I gave him a Sonny Stitt solo on um, uh, Jack Spratt, I think it was called. Be, da, ba, ba. It's a bird, it's a Charlie Parker changes. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, blues for Alice changes. I said, take no, no. I'm sorry. I, I take that back. It was, it was study sit solo on just you, just me. Okay. And you know, he's playing some really nice mid range melody, and then he plays some low stuff. But he does. He's all over the horn. So I gave it to the student, and he came back like almost about a month later, and just from playing along with that thing in his ear. His, his embouchure figured out how to get Sonny Stitt's sound. His whole sound opened up, and I, I just couldn't believe it. I said, well, that was the answer. I should not have even tried to be technical about the, the corners pulling down and the teeth and just give him something where let his, let his ears man, maneuver the chops and put them in place to where he has to get that sound. He, I mean, it opened up his little register. He had a beautiful warm tone after that, all through playing and doing a transcription. So this... picking up the sound really helps. This is so great. This is so great. Yes. And you're exactly right. Sometimes is how we listen to that, you know, inflects our, our sound, our tone, our time. You yeah. Know, the time too. is another thing too. I mean, certain players are like Sonny Stitt would be an easy player to transcribe. Sonny yes, Rollins is very clean. Sonny Rollins would be a little more difficult because it's the rhythm thing. What he does with the rhythm is a little, yeah. little bit different. Cold training in the early stages would have been easy, but then in the later stages would have been maybe difficult, you know, like what? Yeah, I think you're right. Sonny is one of the most difficult in terms of rhythm. Yesterday I was working with a student on uh, on the sunny side of the street, the version with Sonny Stitt and, and Dizzy Gillespie. Oh, that's a sunny And you know... You know Roberto Gambarini's version of that. Have you heard that? Uh, no. Well, Roberto Gambarini sings all the solos, the whole record. Oh. Every, she sings Dizzy's, Sonny Stitz, and Sonny Rollins solo. Right. Exactly. Right. No, I didn't know. I didn't oh, know. yeah, you should listen to it. You know who she is, right? Roberto yeah, yeah, Gambarini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
There's a record she has uh, that uh, where she plays that. So she does the sunny side of the street. It's phenomenal how she gets it. You know, she's got dizzies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, then, yeah, she does. Yeah, she does. And just that that first line, the opening line of Sony, if you want to put it on paper, is so difficult and comes out like a as a contemporary 20th century piece of music, you know, with all fifth tuplets and seven tuplets across the bars. And if you want to be accurate with the writing, you know, but then yeah. you listen to it. And if you listen to a hundred times, you just, you know, play back you play it, yeah. because you understand with your ears. And that's, you know, one of the other great things about transcribing is that you, I play along with both of those solos sometimes. I put them out, I have them written out somewhere, and I'll just put the track on and play along with those. And the Eternal Triangle and After yeah. Hours, those are great, great trans, especially After Hours. Yeah. With that six, eight, you know, that's all, bro how that's broken up. That's a really great solo to, to, uh, to kind of try to, to play along with. And uh, do you write it down when you transcribe or you try to memorize? I think you already sort of answer you know, this uh, question some but... of them I, I write down now what i'm doing is i'm taking them uh, if i have uh, usually it'll be a phrase or an idea i hear somebody do something and i'll put it in a like i, I have a book of things and these are all like all my notes from years of teaching and in my own practice notes so i have them all bound in categories so that wow. when i go through if i go in and i have phrases like uh, this morning i was doing some charlie parker bird phrases and i was I was working them out, and so I put. I would just write them in this book, and I and I write them, to, and I write the chord changes I'm going to practice on, and I and I put them through a cycle. And, Can I buy it? <laughs> well, it's just a, well, yeah. Here it is. Here's the bird thing this morning. I was just, you know, birds doing this pattern. I have a dominant. This is like a dominant arpeggio thing that I have. Yeah. So yeah. I was doing these this bird, two little bird things, and I had been playing this since I was in high school. But I thought, you know, I I, I should try to do this through the cycle of cycle of fifths and so I wrote it down and put it and I have a, a guide sheet of the chord changes and I just I was practicing it so it's just one bar yeah I took it from I uh, took it from Bloom Dito I think it was his solo on Bloom Dito it's the transition from bar four to bar five and what he does with uh, with a certain uh, you know little little device there so I, I put that down so now it would be just like one little a little fragment that I'm working on four bars something like sometimes no, usually no more than four bars but my transcription nowadays is basically that i'm just taking things off i also do another thing you may have the question but i do something that i know jerry berganzi does is i'll put it i'll put a recording on and i won't stop it i'll just keep i'll just go and whatever i hear i try to play back at that moment you know try to play it right back as soon as i hear it and just keep moving it through the recording you're trying to pick out things and try to hear them, try to just play them quickly in time, yeah. move on to the next phrase. Just like spot checking with my ear to see if I can pick stuff up really quickly. Yeah. So that's kind of something I do in time without stopping it and starting it and stopping it. And starting it. This is interesting. I never tried that. I will. Yeah, Jerry does that. That's one of his things. He likes to just put on a thing and just go for it. Whatever you hear, and, and not just the saxophone. If you hear the, the piano player do something or bass or whatever, you just... You try to try to grab those notes quickly in time because that's usually what's happening on the bandstand, right? You're yeah. you're trying your ears trying to hear something and respond to it, so you want to have that, you know, that quick action to be able to do that. That's right. You are you are exactly uh, right, and it's all about you know getting to know also your inner listening. Yeah. Because uh, in in the in the episode that I recorded with Roberto, we talked about this, and I I came up to the conclusion that when we play and when we improvise, it is like if we are transcribing ourselves in oh, real yeah, time, right. yeah. because yeah. you hear things in your head, and you have to be able to transfer the sound that you have in your mind onto your horn, and the quicker you are in doing that That's exactly right, and yeah. the better your timing your tone will be you know you will feel natural so to to listen and to train our ears and to be able to do that thing that jay bergonzi does is really yeah, important it's, 
it really helps. I think just play along with it. I'll put something on. I'll just go go through the recording and just grab whatever I can grab by ear. Yeah, that's great. And and sometimes, sometimes yeah. I'll be driving in the car and I'll be have a tape or something on or whatever, and I'm playing and I hear something and I stop it and I sing it, and I'm saying, oh, I want to get that when I get back home. I can hear. I like that idea. And if I'm quick enough, and if if I can remember what it is, I'll come back home and I'll I'll yeah. just quickly jot it down because I've heard it and I don't have my horn with me or anything like that. Yeah. I'm not that great with it. I mean, there are other guys who can grab it just like that out of the air, you know. Yeah. I I studied with uh, Dave Liban and he's also a great a supporter and uh, fan of, of the trans transcription oh, okay. process and he taught me this methodology to uh, back in those days to transfer uh, like one chorus to transfer on a tape like several yeah. times on a cassette mm -hmm. because back in those days in the cars yeah. we had we had cassettes <laughs> you know so I was like I remember a Stan Gates solo that I, I was transcribing from the album Stan Gates plays I have transcribed the whole album eventually in the end, but I was struggling to get uh, that wonderful solo on The Way You Look Tonight, oh, sure. which is like medium up tempo and he plays so well, you know, so, so clean, so beautiful timing. So I transcribed like one chorus, I copied one chorus on the cassette like 20 times and then I'm in the car driving and the solo is going and I'm singing back. Sing it back, right? So after like a week of doing so, I could go home and basically sing back. I had the first chorus in my head and that mm -hmm. made a bit easier, you know, to find the notes because I, I already had it here. So I knew exactly what was the next line, the next phrase. And I, I had just to check and fix few notes that I wasn't sure. Uh, but that was a great, another great process, you know, to copy the same thing, even if it's eight bars, you know, you did, uh, um, you need that sort of repetition in your listening to listen like a hundred times back and try to sing back is another very efficient way. Yeah, well, yeah. Learn. I, I sing with, you know, when I, when I used to, well, I studied with Lee Conus a, a little bit, but we taught together and he would tell me, he said the first thing he does in the morning when he gets up is he puts on, when he's making coffee, he puts on either Lester Young, Billie Holiday, you know, or Charlie Parker, and he'll just sing with the song, Sinatra, he'll just sing with the, for an hour before he even puts the horn in his mouth, he just sings, and then he would go to put the instrument in his mouth, but he wants to get this thing going first before he even picks up the horn, and that's something he learned from Tristano, Yeah, you know, vocalize first, yeah. Yeah, I used to say, if you can sing it, you can play it. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, once you have it, you know, you... Yeah because you can hear that sound, so it won't be too difficult to... Um, yeah, that's it, a great it doesn't song. work the other way. If you can play it, it doesn't mean you can sing it. No, no. Because maybe you are reading, you know, and you are just yeah. using a theoretical idea. Uh, so this is a, a quite controversial question. When you transcribe and when you work uh, for such a long time on, on one artist, do you ever feel that you are becoming that artist or you are copying someone? Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, you do think that. And then even Dave Liebman in some in his transcription says, you want to become that guy for three minutes is what he, I even have a tape of Dave. I have it right on my phone. He's talking about transcription and he says a student, he says, and you're trying to become that guy for three minutes, whatever the solo is. And that's what you No, He says, well, you going to, are you going to play it in your solo? It may come in, you may alter it, but it's still, not, it's still you. It's not, you know, it's, it isn't that guy. And you use it. You're using those transcriptions, I think, for like inflection and for like articulation and the idea was probably something that Louis Armstrong played and you're taking it from, you know, Charlie Parker or Coltrane. And then it's an old, it's an idea that's come through the history of jazz and just been reworked. Hmm. And, uh, you know, and so it's, it, it, it is, it may, it may not even be the guy that you're listening to his original idea, but you're taking it and you'll use it maybe some other way. You may play it verbatim or you may just, I may choose not to play it at all. Sometimes I, I transcribe this stuff and it never comes into my playing. 
And then other times I'll be, I did a record date the other day and I play, I, play, I quoted a challenge, didn't, didn't realize it. And I quoted a Charlie Parker thing that I had worked on years ago and it, it just came out of my plane. But that's just what I heard at the moment. Yes. And it doesn't bother me. A little respect to Bird every once in a while. Is... So do you, do you have any strategy like on how to incorporate those uh, lines, those things that you are transcribing well, into your playing, or is just let them, you know, sediment yeah, inside I, I you, and yeah, then eventually they will come out. Yeah, I try not to consciously try to pull something out of the reservoir and bring it up. I just play it if it's there, if it's down underneath seething, it will sometimes work its way to the top, and uh, you know, at least you have this arsenal down there. that's one other thing that i always said was if if a player has many patterns and ideas and licks and things that he's memorized and worked through different keys i don't think that's wrong there's nothing wrong with that because i think the more you have memorized that you can quote the more you'll try to take a chance to invent something else because you know i'm safe if i fail i've always got something i can draw from underneath that i've learned years ago so now that i have this arsenal of material behind me why not take one step further and just keep going and see what i can find if i get in trouble i can call up something that i know and it will save me and we all know how the mind works in time it's like so quick it's so you know like it's just a minute fraction of being able to like Here's, here's something and quickly pull up that idea. People don't even understand how it's done sometimes. And we as players know that we can do that. As things are moving along in time, in motion, we have this reservoir of stuff that we can, we can either look forward and straight ahead and look at the, where we're going with the chord structure or what have you and just keep moving our mind through the chord structure. If we want to, we can call up a pattern or a lick or an idea, which is basically outlining what the chord is anyway. But you know, like the Charlie Parker lick or something like that, being able to kind of call those up. But I th I've always encouraged students to learn and memorize a lot of stuff. I've said patterns, licks, solos, whatever. Songs, especially. You know, like learn tunes and chord structure along with the patterns, because that way it'll, the tune itself will basically guide you to where you want to go. Yeah, I think you said something really important there, that uh, you never try to deliberately no. pull up something at a, at a certain moment, which is, you know, a delicate thing. And we got this question from students a lot, like, oh, I should learn more patterns, I should play more patterns. And usually I say, no, you shouldn't learn more patterns, because then... Uh, I mean, whenever I try to do so, to to say, oh, this is the same chord progression of that solo that I described, so now I can play that phrase, and I, yeah. whenever I tried, I failed miserably. Yeah, it always, it always fails. Because yeah. it's not genuine, it's not driven by the moment, it's not the same kind of situation, maybe the rhythm section is playing something else, you know, and that line sounds so awkward, because it's it's like... You know, taking you know, know, a different one... face and put on a different body. It, it's it's like awkward. It's really strange. How many times have you done this? You're trading eights with another horn player or with the piano player. And you're, it's not your time, turn to play. And already you think, I'm going to come in with this phrase now. The next one, I, when it's my turn, I've got this great lick that I'm going to start off. I know what I'm going to play. That's the point when you uh, like I, that happens to me a lot of times. I say, "Oh man, I got this. I'm going to play this," and then as soon as I get say, "No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just said, I'm not going to. I'm just going to wait to see when the bar drops and see what my mind tells me because I know I can do the other thing. I've already set it up in my mind. I'm going to quote quote this tune, or I'm I'm going to play what he just played. Yeah. So you have to. Yeah. That's that's a good place to check yourself in the in the exchange when you're exchanging eights. Don't set yourself up for what you're going to play on the, for your eight when it comes up. Yeah. Or four. I think premeditation in, in jazz is always, you know, not a great thing to do. Even, you know, when you do small ensembles in, in schools and you can feel that someone has premed, premeditated, you know, how to start the solo or... Maybe the drummer has already decided that at the end of the alto solo, it will drop the dynamic and will start again from soft 
you know, and spas. And why, you know, the, the question is why you decided beforehand, you know, this yeah. music lives in the moment. So, uh, and I like the word that you used before, you need to have an arsenal uh, yeah. of, of well, like I, ideas. That, that is... you, that, I think it brings comfort and it brings a, a, an ease to make you feel more comfortable to take a chance because you know you're you're covered if anything goes wrong you're covered i do a thing with students where i i make them play wrong notes as many wrong notes as possible in a, so basically i'm trying to get them to keep a line moving no matter what you're playing so we say we're just going to play chromatically through a blues and we I just say and every once in a while while you're playing try to hit a chord tone yeah. just try to grab a chord tone but just keep the line going chromatically you're just let's say you're playing a lot of nonsense basically you're just trying to keep the line moving so you get used to playing a long moving line without thinking i got to do this and so it's chopped it's chopped up you want to keep the, the momentum going Play, sorry about that <laughs> and then um and, and then and eventually you get the feeling of what a long line feels like and then you can start thinking about the chords themselves but i make them play chromatically for a long time it's a, just a technique when you get a student that is, is stops and starts and stops and starts and they play in two bars and then they can't think of what to play next because they've never had the feeling of playing a long long line continually they're basically playing in short phrases now that doesn't work for somebody uh, that's trying to do a real creative solo, but basically when you have that feeling of playing long, 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 long lines, then you can leave stuff out and go back to playing like Lester Young again, maybe playing really good, solid, melodic phrases. Leave some space for the listener to digest what you just played. Play another, you know, a phrase that has a, you know, a meaning to where it's going. There is also the that other paradox that uh, when we transcribe and we let the music after several months that we have worked on that transcription, we leave it. And then eventually, years later, you know, you go back to listen to that recording and you realize that maybe Sonny Rollins is playing your lines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but th this is what I call the paradox of transcribing because you you become unconscious that you are playing something that has been digested through the years and yeah. only like after five six years you realize that oh this is where that line is coming from and you recognize I, yourself <laughs> what did I, I saw that the other day and i can't remember what it was i was reading through somebody and i thought Oh, that's where that comes from. You know, I, I, I wish I could have, I should have written it down, but I just realized, I can't remember who it was, but um, it was somebody. I've been listening a lot to Lester Young in the last couple of days. So I've been listening to Lester Young, but I've been playing Charlie Parker songs when I practice. So one or the other, some, Prez played something that Bird later on that I thought was something that Bird had played, but I can't remember what solo it was from. Yeah. Yeah, it happens to me a lot with uh, with joe henderson i spent a few years working on on joe henderson and then years later i, I listened back to joe henderson and i said oh god well that's that's that that, Stan, that Stan Getz solo you were talking about has something that I, I i studied with joe henderson for a year and that's one of the devices he taught me when Stan Getz goes when he approaches the from the the triplet yeah. from the yeah you know what I mean? It's on the Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know this. Uh, what is it? Right? That's it. That, but yeah. that's one of the things that Joe Henderson had me do as a as a as an exercise. All the diatonic seven chords in the key, right? So if you've got you had me do it in C major or whatever, whatever key you're playing on. It's one of Bird's devices that you see in the solos, right? Yeah. He's got. Right? Yes. You're going, going, oh, is that too loud? I'm not sure. No, 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 it's fine. Then, then what he would have me do is then come down the scale so I, and then and play the half step again. So I go. Then he changed it, and when I got to the top of the note, I would look at the top note that I end on. So if I'm, I was, I'm in C here, so 
you look to see if the, your, the note on top is one, three, five, or six of a major chord, or one, three, five, or seven of a dominant chord. Yeah. So if I, and then you come down that bop scale. So I would go up C major. That B is the third of a G7 chord. So every every top note becomes a one three five or six of a major chord, yeah. or one three five. But that lick is so much part of Charlie. Pa I mean, it goes all the way back to you know Armstrong. Everybody played that idea, but Getz uses it a lot in his soloing. You know, he's oh sort yes, of his... yes. And there is in that solo of Stan Getz, there is that other line that has been haunting me for many years, All right? Yeah, right, that it's, one there, yeah. It's so, so unbelievable, so great, right? No, he was, a, you know, Stan Getz was, he was something else. I mean, just a, a yeah. genius, you know, his solos are... <laughs> They're, they're just uh, I study them see now what I use for uh, uh, solos for is I'm basically analyzing why is this player using that device on this change now uh, Charlie Parker is, is pretty obvious when I mention those two uh, solos to you those Charlie Parker solos those are devices that everybody played like I'm looking at Moose the Mooch you know the bridge <laughs> that, that's a device that Bird used on especially a, a dominant chord when it appeared as a 2-7 in a key. So if you're playing in C major and you get a D7, you would play, like if you've got... Uh... Yeah, that's the D7. That device... So that, that, that part of that bridge would be something that I would take and I say, look, if Bird played that and you see it, you know, variations of that idea coming up throughout his solos, I figured I have to learn that too because I'm not really trying to learn a lick. I'm trying to get a harmony lesson yeah. on why these players played this on the secondary dominant chord in a key. Because why the why the sharp eleven? Yeah, because there's a rule yeah. that I learned years ago from Herb Pomeroy when I was at Berkeley. I mean, that's, that's, where do I have it here? that we had all of these rules that he would give, and he said he learned it from Charlie Parker. So, where are they here? You know, basically, it's a simple harmonic thing like he's got here. Uh, so, 5, 7 in any key will take the Mixolydian mode, altered scale, diminish, anything. Anytime the key, the key is C and a G7 appears, you can do anything you want to it. Yeah. But when, D7, when D7 appears in the key of C, it usually only takes the Mixolydian mode or the Lydian flat 7. But not yeah. always, because Sonny Rollins plays Doxy, and yeah. there's a D7, and he puts the flat nine on it. So these rules basically, and Bird adheres to them in his solos almost like it's law. But every once in a while, he'll break he'll break the, the rules because something else is happening. He's got a phrase where he wants to continue the idea from another key and doesn't care about the chord. Or he's quoting a melody. I was looking at... Uh, What's the solo I told you? Yardbird Suite, is that the one? Yeah, he, where he's playing Yardbird Suite. Yardbird Suite has a certain amount. The rules are just basically defined there. You go to a major chord, you go to flat 7-7, seven, seven, A to G7. Flat 7-7 seven, seven has to take the mixed Lydian mode or the Lydian mode. You can't put a flat 9 on that chord or sharp 9. You could, but it's not usually done traditionally. Yeah. But over here, he violates the rule. He plays a natural nine on a six dominant chord. Normally, the six dominant has a flat nine on it, but he's playing a melody. He's quoting the melody, so the the melody takes precedence over the fact that there's a there's a, there's a sorry about that. There's a no, no, you know, it's fine. You know what I'm saying. But all the other rules he he makes. He goes here, you know, so data. Right there, flat seven seven. He stays right on the mixolydian mode with the bop scale passing back. Does the same thing over here. Then he's got six dominant, and there's the flat nine sharp nine. Then he's got two seven, and two seven always takes nine and thirteen. And so he, it's exactly like a like it's like Bach. I mean, it's everything's correct, except sometimes in the heat of the moment, 
he either is pushing a phrase, delaying a phrase, or hearing something else, and the rule will change. But 98% of the time, he adheres to those old traditional rules of, uh, of harmony. You know, flat seven, flat seven, seven in a key, four dominant in a key, two seven in a key. Usually, take mixolydian mode or lydian mode. And, and how much you think Charlie Parker was conscious about that? I don't think he. Uh, to quote Red Rodney, and I've got a podcast. He says, I, "He says I don't think Charlie Parker knew anything about chord changes." He said that I was always asking Bird, "We're playing uh, the, the song is you." Bird, what does the bridge go on this? He said, uh, B flat seven. He just said, B flat seven. He just, didn't, he just didn't know. He just heard it. Chet Baker was the same way. I used to work with Chet Baker. He just, the, the way they grew up and learned tunes by ear and plotted the stuff in their mind is something that I can't comprehend because I went through the Berkeley Schillinger system and everything was mapped out and codified and had all been put together in a, in a system. Had I been on the road like Stan Guess with Jack Teagarden at 17 or 16 years old, learning just tunes every night, every night and playing, I would have had a whole different way of learning a song. But yeah. my system has to be to these rules, I have to think. Yeah. This. And so, you know. But to some extent, it was a very, very extreme version of the transcription process, like to learn, because every single theory rule that we have in music comes after a sonic issue right? Yeah, right even even the parallel fifths or parallel octaves in classical music you know that, that are seen as like evil oh, yeah. um, uh, but there was a practical issue that they are hard to sing so yeah. if you know if you don't have very very highly uh, knowledgeable singers in a choir that would be a disaster in terms of tuning so that's why the rule came out that and, and you also weaken the harmonic sound you know of every everything i so mean all co of contrary the... contrary motion has also other different reasons but anyway i think that if you can learn the theory from the sound and then of course you can go and study why you know the sharp 11 sounds better on a secondary yeah. dominant uh but if you learn the sound, that's it. You know, th yeah, that's you all you need when you play to, to learn that period, to yeah. that specific sound, even because every single rule in music has a sound which is unique. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, I, I, like I the Triton that. substitution. How can you recognize? Well, listen to it. And it's after a while, it becomes, you know, clear. Oh, that's a Triton substitution. And because you recognize the sound, but you need to transcribe it a lot. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. For sure. Yeah, that's great. And uh, we are heading to the last question. But, okay. Uh, which transcribed solo uh, that, you, that you've done is your favorite and why? It's a bit of a dumb question. I know that oh, maybe there are many, but if you should pick one. The one that's still haunting me is probably Lester Young playing I Want to Be Happy. Oh. Right. You know that one? You know? Yes, I never transcribed it, but I know oh, the track. It's, 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 I still, I mean, I quote it all. I quote all the time from it. I still have fragments of it. I can't, I can't play. I don't know how much I can play. But, I mean, there's things in there that I learned when I was a kid. Like, he'll play, uh... <laughs> So when you when you do all of those um that that those ideas but especially all of that stuff that, that that appears in that soul yeah some of those things I still I still use because they're really actually they're very modern like they, you can use them today and they they work great in a, in a soul but that soul when i was trying to find out those false fingerings i can remember <clears throat> well here's a transcription to you i remember listening to coltrane's harmony when i was a kid and that's that solo where he's placed where you go <laughs> I remember as a 
kid saying, how does he do that? I couldn't figure it out. Then I read an article about Monk saying, Coltrane saying, Monk taught me how to do that. I said, well, how would Monk know about <laughs> saxophone fingering? So I figured, well, what does Monk... Uh, and I, tried, I tried to figure out what Monk would do. And so I figured out that that Monk's, very, Monk's characteristic interval was the flat five. So I went... Well, I'd say I'm playing a B flat, and what's the flat five of the B flat would be the E natural. Yeah. So I would play the, I would figure the B flat, but open the E natural key, which is a tritone away, and I'd get that. Then I'd, I'd finger an A, and what's the tritone from an A? It would be the E, the e flat, and I'd, fig, I'd open the E flat key. And sure enough, the notes came out. But it took me about nine years to figure that out. Just from, uh, <laughs> I couldn't get it. From, I couldn't get it from listening to the track. I had to have somebody say something, and I said, "Oh, well, it's Monk, and it's flat five. And then I figured it out and, and and got it that way. Yeah, you learn all those tricks that are not on any saxophone book at all. <laughs> oh, no, I mean I was see that Lester Young. So I mean, he's, first of all, it's it's. Uh, the rhythm section is great on it. They do some really mysterious things where they push the time and pull. If you go back and listen to it, where Buddy Rich, and there's no bass, so it's just drums, piano, and luster. And press play is great. But that whole album with the trio, I know Branford Marsalis plays, and he can play that solo note for note, uh, Back to the Land. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a blues, I think, in, in F concert. And Branford, that's one of his go-to uh, Lester Young solos. But it's that solo of Lester Young's. I mean, there's Coltrane solos that I've listened to. Stan Getz, Blues for Mary Jane was another one that was a big uh, hit for me. I love that one. Um, a lot of Coltrane solos that I listen to. Uh, Richie Kamuka mm -hmm. on uh, a, a tune called Vamps Blues. If you haven't heard that, listen to his stop time chorus and try to take it's called yeah. It's Shelly Man and His Men at the Black Hawk. Listen to Richie Kamuka's stop time chorus on Vamps Blues, V A M P S Blues. I will, all, and I, I will put all those references in the podcast description. Yeah, like anyway. all, those those records, Shelley Mann, Live at the Black Hawk, Volume One, Two, Three, and Four, were big influences on me because I loved the Richie Kamuka's playing. He was a distillation of Lester Young and Stan Getz and the, 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 those early players, but he had his own thing going. But that stop time chorus, I still play along with that one and try to grab stuff from that. And and there again, it's the inflections, the way he. You know, slurs into notes and plays notes and does these little triplets, but he's got some really great ideas in there. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, but is there a website where people can go and listen to your music or buy your music? Uh, you know, I don't have one actually. Honestly, I'm, <laughs> if there's something I may have to get going at some point. I've yeah. just always done done stuff off the bandstand or people buy it from the company um i just recorded another album last week with don thompson the piano player we just did okay. another we have we have three duo albums out in japan so we just recorded another one last week for the japanese company um it should be coming out soon but uh, i mean there those those things are available you know i don't cons concern myself anymore with marketing because it's gone so much into the People are always complaining about the, the streaming sites and whether yeah. or not getting enough money and all of that. And so uh, Kirk and I have a CD out of Coltrane, a tribute CD that we've done. And um, we basically sell it off the bandstand or he has it on CD Baby, I think. I'm not okay. sure. Yeah, I mean, those are out there. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the name of that album? A Train of Thought. Yeah. Train of Fight. I've thought, T-H-O-U-G-H-T, and it's on, uh, uh, I, gotta, I just got to think of the label in just a second and I'll figure it out. I, I, I should train a thought. According to Wikipedia. Uh, Pat, Mc, Pat LaBarber, Kirk McDonald, train of thought. Yeah, yeah, here, I will. Yeah. It's on, uh, I'm trying to figure the... the yeah, there it is. There, it's, uh, I will. Don't worry. I will. I will do my it's research. Live, it's live and live at the Rex, and there's that's Kirk okay. and I doing. Yeah, we have a volume two. I think that's coming out soon. Yeah, that's great. 
That's great. So, uh, Pat, it has been really a pleasure to talk to you again and to see you. Yeah. And also, thanks so much for contributing to this podcast. Uh, I hope yeah. that all the listeners enjoy and all the description of uh, Pat's work and also the recordings that he mentioned will be in the podcast description. So keep following us and keep following the clinic. Uh, big shout out to Pat LaBarbera that today has uh, spent this time with us. Thank you so much and we hear you all next time. Bye-bye. Okay.